we're in a period when people are sort of opening newspapers every day and seeing new superlatives about China, the fastest supercomputer, the world's second economy, the first to launch the, some man-to-the-moon mission coming up to China, which will uh, get a lot of people going. But the positive luster of all of that that accompanied the Olympics in 2008 has been covered over with a bit of a tarnish uh, because of Chinese uh, pushiness on a number of issues, whether it's maritime claims around its periphery or its uh, position on human rights or its pushback on the Western model of economic development where China says, we don't need that Western model, we're going to go our own way. And obviously the big political issue in Washington, um, the currency issue, which is probably not the right place to focus, but it's, it's an important part of our trading and economic relationship and has become the political football uh, in U.S.-China relations. China, as far as I can tell, China is responding to U.S. pressure to revalue its currency, and it will re do that slowly because uh, when you do that, you lose jobs on, on production lines in China, and they want to keep their jobs too. Uh, but more importantly, China's rebalancing investment and consumption in its domestic economy. Uh, we're looking for evidence of that. The Chinese are talking a pretty good game right now. The question is whether they will follow through. The conventional journalistic narrative, you know, things have been going on for years, and they don't get noticed by the journalists, but the Secretary of State takes a trip and suddenly people write about it as if it were, gee whiz, they've discovered how to counter China. Um, if you put that kind of childishness aside, uh, there is a, there's been a steady concern in the region about China. There, people are not rejecting China in Southeast Asia or East Asia. Korea depends on it as a major production platform. Japan would not be able to pay its citizens their high wages and their retirement payments if they didn't have a lot of factories producing very profitably in, in China. Uh, Taiwan is growing closer to China economically, if not politically. And in Southeast Asia, there's the trade and tourist and other relationships are intense. So it's not a simple yes, U.S., no China kind of thing. It's uh, an effort on their part to in, in the regions around China to be able to look over their shoulder and see a comforting Uncle Sam and his military presence there as a source of stability. If you live in a small country like uh, Singapore or even a, a physically big but economically small country like Thailand, uh, you depend on global order being maintained. If, if global disorder reigns, the cost of everything increases and the opportunities for business and investment decline. And the U.S. has been providing that order since 1945. China looks like it has half bought into that order, but not quite. And so people are concerned as China uh, becomes a bigger, bigger factor in everyday life, how much China is going to respect the order or try to change it. And there's a, there's a strong concern in the region. It's a very conservative and understandable concern that they want the U.S. around to preserve the existing uh, international order. Uh, and if making changes, make them by consensus and in small increments so that people have predictability in their uh, national and business lives. The newspapers see shifts. They say there are shifts, but I just don't see them in his actual behavior. Um, the U.S., uh, I mean, I was one of those people telling the members of the administration they ought to speak up about the South China Sea, and I still think we ought to be very assertive ourselves in the Yellow Sea about our right uh, to conduct military exercises there alone or with our South Korean or Japanese allies. Um, but I think the administration is equally determined to do that. I don't, th I don't see them um, uh, shifting lines to a tougher view of China. They're pretty cold-eyed. We told the Chinese we needed some movement on the currency by the time of the G20 in Toronto, and the weekend before the G20, they announced they're going to move their currency. Uh, but they didn't move it much. It went up about 1.5% over the subsequent four months. So the U.S. told them again, look, it's not fast enough. Let's get back to the pace you revalued the currency between 2005 and the middle of 2007, which was about 
and lo and behold, the Chinese have now revalued about that much. A part of this is the uh, sword of Damocles hanging over China's head that they imagined the congressional uh, legislation on currency, which would allow the U.S. to declare China has a, or some country has a manipulated currency, and then we would take them to the World Trade Organization and impose uh, uh, tariffs on their products uh, until the WTO rules against us or for us. Um, that legislation has been through the House. It hasn't been through the Senate. Uh, I think it would be very hard for Hu Jintao as president of China to come here for a state visit if that bill is passed. And so they're watching very carefully. And uh, the, the obvious QED to this problem is, well, if you want to have a state visit and you don't want the currency bill to be passed, revalue your currency faster. And they've been doing that. And we, we, I would anticipate China will raise the value of its currency by about 5% by about January. One issue that's really uh, stirred people up has been that of rare earths and whether China has been using that as a political weapon in its relationship with Japan and the United States. Um, I have to say there's been a lot of really terrible journalism on the subject of rare earths. Uh, it hasn't been informed by a look back into our own history or a look at, the, at what China has been saying loudly for the last couple of years about its plans. China announced more than a year ago that it was going to uh, start to uh, husband its, its extraction and sales of uh, rare earths. Part of this, I understand, is also uh, not just uh, concern about availability and long-term viability of the industry. Well, some of it also has to do with smuggling and people's uh, getting hold of assets in China and reselling them for, uh, for profiteering purposes. And uh, you know, so rent-seeking by the intermediaries in that trade, and China's trying to clean some of that up. Uh, the um, announcement last year and then further announcement this past summer said they were going to reduce their exports to uh, three-quarters of the former high and unsustainable levels. And that three-quarter point was hit at the, precisely the same time the Japanese and Chinese were having a squabble over fishing boat frictions with Japanese Coast Guard. Uh, cutter in the, in the Senkaku or Diaoyudao Islands, uh, between, disputed territory between China and Japan. And a lot of Japanese looked up and said, what, we're not getting our rare earths, this must be aimed at Japan. And they probably found people in China who said, yeah, it's aimed at you. And then you know, a few weeks later, Americans said, we're not getting ours either. And they said, well, you supported Japan. Uh, but it all goes back to an underlying problem. And I can take you back even farther. We used to produce, subsidize, and store rare earths for our own strategic industry purposes. And in the 1990s, we gave up on storing it for our industry and producing it because, one, the EPA costs, the environmental costs, were getting high because it's a very um, intense process to pull the rare earths out of a lot of soil. And secondly, because costs in the U.S. are much higher than they are in China, and China was producing it cheaply, so why keep pulling it out of the ground in the U.S. when you can just buy it from China? And thirdly, we're looking for that, that post-Cold War peace dividend. And since we had done rare earths uh, stockpiling as a Cold War measure, let, let's make a profit and sell it quick, put it on the U.S. Treasury, and, uh, and get out of that business. Well, those decisions were all made, and, and people in the rare earths industry know about them, but people in the newspapers don't, apparently, and they've been writing this up as some kind of pointed Chinese gesture. Mrs. Clinton, when she launched her recent visit to Asia, said she was going to take this issue up, and at, before she even spoke, the Chinese were already announcing they were trying to get some rare earths out. They're trying to get this controversy off their backs. On the South China Sea, we've, the U.S. has taken a position that there should be uh, uh, negotiations in common over the future access to the, to the waters and territories there. Um, the U.S. has taken no position on the, on the uh, negotiations or the outcomes of the uh, common exercise in negotiation. Um, that's been mischaracterized again in the media quite frequently as the U.S. siding with Vietnam or something on a particular outcome. And that, that's an overstatement of where the U.S. is on that. But no question the South China Sea is vital to the shipping of the world. You know, something like 75 or 80 percent of Australian shipping goes through the South China Sea. 
Japanese energy supplies are almost entirely from there, um, passed through there. And so it's, it, it, we have a very important interest in maintaining the freedom of navigation that we've enjoyed up to now and which could be threatened if we were to exceed the Chinese territorial ambitions. We have the Senkaku Islands dispute where the U.S. turned the islands over to Japan in 1972 after seizing them in 1945. And uh, we never, we turned them over to Japanese administration, but we did not turn them over as sovereign territory of Japan. And since then, we've maintained an alliance relationship which says we will protect Japan in those areas it administers. But we also say we don't recognize that Japan is the sovereign of those particular islands. It's a kind of a bit complicated position to take, um, but it helps to straddle the, the uh, relative realities of China's uh, claims and Japan's claims and Taiwan's claims on the islands, while at the same time providing the promise of stability through the alliance uh, protection of Japanese interests there. The United States still has uh, significant differences with China over North Korea's per perpetration of the sinking of a South Korean ship. China continues to deny it. Over the past weekend, Xi Jinping, the heir apparent in China, the vice president, made a kind of blood-curdling speech about the 60th anniversary of the Chinese people's volunteers, so-called, entering into the conflict with the U.S. and characterizing the war on the Korean Peninsula in terms that are unrecognizable to people familiar with the facts of history. Uh, that the U.S. had somehow perpetrated in the invasion and started the war. It was ridiculous uh, on its face, and you can even find Chinese history books that will refute that, but they continue to, to say that sort of thing. It means that we're still very far apart um, intellectually and strategically from China on what to do with North Korea. Uh, China is now in the process of supporting the unsupportable, the transition to the third generation of Kims in North Korea. Uh, a friend of mine who speaks French calls him Kim Jong Twa, the third um, Kim Jong Un, this new uh, impossible-looking um, successor. China seems to feel that saying something now about how stupid the succession is um, is more dangerous than waiting later and watch how the succession fails and deal with the crisis then. You know, tomorrow's crisis is always better than today's. And but the U.S. would like to get moving on this uh, set of problems, get them out of the nuclear weapons business, out of the provocation business. Um, and, but I think we're at loggerheads with the Chinese for some time to come on that, at least until the leadership changes in 2012 and after in China. It's pretty clear that the mood in China is becoming uh, increasingly nationalistic. The Chinese government seems to be trying to contain the anti-Japanese sentiments that are emerging in street protests. Um, historically, these kinds of protests have taken down Chinese regimes in the past. And so the government doesn't really st stir them up. These are coming from the people in some way. But it's also an, a product of relentless propaganda against Japan uh, over the years and, um, and the unfortunate history of the war. Now this uh, anti-Japanese feeling is spreading and is spreading against the U.S. as well. And, uh, and Southeast Asians have come in for it, the Vietnamese, because of the disputes over the South China Sea. There's a kind of rising Chinese xenophobia. And uh, this is combined with a leadership cautiousness that's really hard to, I mean, you look at a country growing so fast, making huge decisions about um, energy intensity, closing steel factories at a stroke to reduce energy intensity, very brave. But when it comes to foreign affairs and domestic politics, extremely conservative and cautious. And they're very reluctant to get in the way of this rising nationalism. So, in fact, they're kind of accommodating that keep the streets quiet, don't let protesters merge, but we'll let people express themselves through the internet and through the, the so-called free media that have now emerged in China. Hundreds of new radio and TV stations and journals are, are 
publishing all sorts of opinion. And the politically correct opinion these days is pretty hostile to outside forces. And so we're seeing an iteration now between the rulers and the ruled where the, uh, the, the population is sort of pushing the rulers and the rulers are, are, are giving back to the population. So they're getting themselves into a crescendo of, of hostility to the outside world. And then occasionally something comes up like the summit meeting that's going to take place here in the United States with President Hu Jintao. And he intervenes to keep it cool until he gets through a summit meeting. And then when that's over, they'll go back to venting themselves again. And this is going to be a source of problems for us. We really need the Chinese to loosen up their system, but do it responsibly. You know, if you're going to allow people more freedom, you've got to pull back on the propaganda. Or, or if you're going to have the propaganda and the control apparatus, you're going to have to use it effectively. You have to make a choice, and they're not making that choice right now. And it's, it's, a, a, un, it's adding an unhealthiness to the way China deals with the rest of the world, and it's part of why uh, the region surrounding China is showing more and more neuralgia. China had a kind of smile diplomacy for a decade from the late 90s on. It was very effective. The diplomats did a terrific job there. Their investment in trade patterns, their opening of uh, free trade agreements really won a lot of friends. But this new uh, angry nationalism in China is making people nervous.